Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this uh, lecture number 14 on this course on the psychology of language. Now the topic of today that we are going to discuss is about discourse and discourse is the highest level of language. So let me first introduce a little bit about discourse, then we will take a journey back onto what we did up till now and then from there on, once we have finished the journey, we will start today's lecture and start discussing things about discourse. As I said, discourse is the highest uh, form of language. We all have uh, been in situations where we are riding elevators with people we do not know and still we have to make conversation with them. As children, we have been taught not to talk to strangers, but with among friends, we do a lot of talking. And this form of talking where we share ideas between people, they basically comprise of what is called discourse. Now discourse as I said is the highest form of any language where you not only put your uh, phonemes and morphemes and words and sentences together, but these sentences are then exchanged between people. Now the discourse that we talk about is generally in two forms. We have something called uh, the narratives in which one person speaks and other person listens to them. And the other form of discourse is called conversation where there are number of in interlocutors which basically means that number of people which speak with uh, among each other taking turns for their speech. So basically then speech is using language to exchange ideas, whether it is exchanging ideas in scientific conferences or it could be normal chit chat that we do in everyday life, discourse is the key to all form of human communication. And so what we will be doing today is we will be looking at what is discourse, we will be evaluating its various features and this lecture then will very well meld into another lecture which is lecture number 15, we will try and cover the whole of discourse and basically we are interested in the psychological aspects of discourse. Now before we start today's lecture and start looking at what discourse is in its basic form, let us take a look back into where we started off this whole series of psychology of language. So we uh, started off by looking at uh, the very basic of language uh, as in uh, we were interested in finding out what is the very basic form of language. So there we focused a little bit onto the animal communication system which is the very basic form of language and we started evaluating this animal communication system. Why do animals communicate? And so we studied various reasons of why animals communicate and what is the form of this communication and what kind of ideas can be exchanged is what we focused on. Now once we looked at the animal communication system in a little bit detail and the characteristics of such a system, we moved on to looking at how the human language is made up of and we started studying the basics of the human language system a little bit into the human language system. Now, we did that in order to make the distinguish between any animal communication system which is the basic form of communication and how does it differ from the animal communication system. So we looked at the uh, how the phonemes meld into the, uh, the morphemes to word to sentences to discourse and how this whole situation moves uh, right from ground up so from the speech sound to using words to form symbols and using these symbols into sentences and exchanging ideas. We also 
went down the uh, path of looking at how language evolved uh, right from the very beginning. So, we looked at the evaluation of language uh, and uh, we studied various possible ideas which, which predict how language actually evolved. So, we looked at the idea how it evolved, how it would have evolved from the proto humans uh, from the great great grand uh, fathers that we have and uh, how the possibility of language would have develop or how language would have developed. We also looked at two theories, uh, the rapid and the non-rapid theory of language uh, uh, evaluation. One theory says that language evaluated very rap rapidly, the other theory says that language evaluation was a much slower process and so through the slow process of evaluation from one uh, stage to the other stage, language would have evolved. And the last thing that we did was we looked at some evidences, fossils of uh, the fact that language would have evolved from uh, our ancestors. And so, uh, some of the evidences that we, we uh, focused on is the idea of the proto language uh, which uh, are uh, which were used by our ancestors and the idea of Pitgins which basically suggests that language would have evolved from, uh, uh, from the very uh, basic uh, uh, ideas or very basic concepts or uh, uh, very basic systems. Now, once we were sure of how a language would have evolved and we went down the memory lane looking at the history of language, uh, human language systems, we moved into uh, understanding how research in language is done that is the science of language. And so, there we looked at what is the scientific method, what the scientific method composed of, we looked at how theories are built, how uh, 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 hypotheses are set, observations collected and these observations tested. So, basically using both the induction and the deduction method, how do we uh, do research in, uh, in any behavioral sciences for general and language for specific. We looked at what kind of experimental designs can be used in language studies and we discussed the uh, basic of experimental designs both the within subject and the uh, between subject designs. We focused on to something called the various behavioral techniques which are used for um, uh, measuring or uh, experimenting with language. We looked at what kind of dependent variables, what kind of effect variables we can use in language studies and we focused. Uh, primarily on latency which is the reaction time and the accuracy which is how correct somebody produces a particular sentence or a word or for that matter anything the correctness of any uh, event and these two as the basic idea of how language research is done what is measured in a language research. And lastly we uh, focused on to some of uh, the facts how language and brain are related. So, we looked at those areas of the brain especially focused on to the Broca and the, um, the Wernicke area of the brain and how they are related and we uh, also uh, looked into some of the newer techniques of studying language using the uh, brain measurement uh, for example, the EEG and MRI. Now, once we had uh, some idea of what uh, the language is all about and how research in language is done. The next phase was looking at how, what is the basic unit of language. And so, the basic unit of language is the sound, the sound wave. And so, the next interest uh, of course, was how these sound waves are captured and processed and another interesting thing was how they are produced. So, because the sound waves are what is analyzed by humans and these sound waves are what is processed and meanings generated out of it. So, the whole idea of language is built around the sound waves and so, we were interested in looking at how and what are the uh, various features of this sound waves. So, we looked started looking into uh, in the third section into what is auditory perception. So, uh, we, we looked at the basic of sound waves, uh, how the fundamental frequency, uh, the overtones, the amplitude and frequency how uh, and what they mean uh, for the uh, perceiver or for the person who is hearing this sound wave. We also looked at the construction of the human ear uh, which uh, basically uh, hears these sound waves and how meaning is extracted out of it or the, how these sound waves, uh, the change in these sound waves are extracted and interpreted in the 
brain. Then we looked at what the speech stream is consisting of. So, once once we have the sound wave, once we make speech, what does it composed of? So, we looked at a typical example of a spectrogram and from this spectrogram we looked at what the spectrogram reveals. So, we looked at things like uh, how uh, the plosives, the fricatives, uh, these, these are uh, basic speech patterns uh, which human beings produce in terms of the basic uh, speech sound that they produce. So, how these are produced and how they are interpreted and that was of interest to us there. And lastly, uh, uh, we looked at the development of speech perception. So, how did speech perception actually develop in human human beings that was uh, of next interest to us. And so, uh, uh, we looked at uh, things like uh, several uh, models of speech perception uh, development uh, and, and uh, what these models were uh, about how baby talk and uh, how uh, learning in, in, in the uh, womb, how these things uh, suggest how infants learn uh, to perceive speech. So, this baby, the idea of baby talk, the idea of um, uh, other uh, narrowing down of speech or this kind of evidences provide how the infants actually learn to perceive speech. And lastly, we looked at some theories of speech perception. So, basic interest for us was in the motor theory uh, of speech perception, the idea of the general auditory framework of speech perception and lastly, the idea of direct realism which explain how speech is perceived or theories which explain how perception of speech takes place. Now, once we had uh, this idea about how speech is perceived, we moved on to looking at how speech is produced because that is the most logical thing to look at next. And so, we looked at uh, the idea of how the vocal tract is composed of and how it makes. <laughs> then, we were interested in looking at speech areas of the brain. So, what are the different areas of the brain which produces speech? So, more, uh, the most interesting area was the interaction between the Wernicke area and the broken area and we looked at the models of Gashwin uh, uh, Wernicke model which explained how speech are uh, produced. We looked at how uh, consonants and vowels and, and other uh, basic speech sounds are produced by the uh, human vocal tract and human vocal system. Then we got interested in looking at what are the various models of speech production and the models that we uh, uh, looked into detail where the feed forward and feedback control model, the auditory suppression model and we looked at the dual stream model and the DIVA. So, for DIVA is a more computational model. So, we looked at these four models in detail which basically tells us how our speech are produced or gives us an idea of speech production. And lastly, we looked at how the development of speech happens in children. So, we looked at evidences from babbling, the frame and content model and uh, social aspects of babbling, speech delays and disorders as evidences of how development of speech happens in smaller children. Now, once we had this idea of how speech is not only produced but also perceived, the next important thing was looking at when these speech sounds are composed together, comprised together, the basic phones that we are talking about, what do they make? And uh, the answer to this is that it makes words. So, the next obvious idea was looking at what are words and what do they mean. So, uh, how words are used and what is the meaning of word. Now, since word is a wave station between higher order cognitive processing in language and lower order uh, uh, basic cognitive processes. So, we uh, dedicated some three basic sections or three basic lectures into studying words. Now, the first thing that we did was we looked at the anatomy of a word. What are words and what do they <coughs> mean and so we looked at what are the what does word symbolize the various forms of word for example the content word and the uh, the functional word we looked at some forms of word uh, which are shape shifters and we also looked at how the phonology of uh, the, the word really works. For example, how are syllables divided into the onset and the rhyme and the rhyme basically then divides into the nucleus and the coda. So, we looked at how the word mean various symbols. So, in detail what does it mean or symbolism of word. Then we looked at how words are learned because that is of another thing and so we found out that there are various theories suggesting that words are learned either as a uh, on a curve which basically means that initially you learn slowly and uh, there is a growth spurt in word learning and then this drops off at some point of time. We also looked at 
uh, the fast and slow uh, uh, method or slow proposals of word learning and how uh, other words within, within the neighborhood of words actually help us in learning words. The next obvious uh, thing to look at was how words are stored uh, and uh, there we looked at the word storage uh, problem. So, we looked at the uh, storage of word in terms of the phonological form and uh, in terms of the pronunciation of the word and in the meaning form. So, we looked at how the mental lexicon is arranged and how this mental lexicon and the cortical arrangement of this mental lexicon stores different word into the human uh, the brain. And lastly, we are interested in looking at once stored how these words are retrieved. So, we looked at spoken uh, the, the various methods of spoken word recognition, uh, spoken word production and models like the Levet forward model and the Dell interactive model which suggest how the words are either uh, retrieve back in terms of a feedback, uh, feedback feed forward connection or in terms of a interactive connection. Once the words are there or we understood what words are, the next in, uh, obvious thing was how these words are joined together to form sentences and what is the meaning of sentences, what is the use of sentences. So, we started looking at the sentence structure, what is sentences and what is the sentence structure look like. We looked at how uh, the thematic roles are, uh, are, are given to various parts of the sentence for example, the agents and the, uh, the patients and how the subject verb object, uh, uh, the SVO format is used by the English language for explaining different word, how clauses and phrases are made and how these clauses and uh, 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 phrases provide the syntactic structure of any sentence. We also looked at how complexity is added into uh, the syntactic structures of uh, sentences. And next, we were in, uh, interested in looking at how sentences are comprehended and so we uh, looked at the idea of the garden path sentence which gives us uh, some mechanisms of how the words, uh, the sentences would have been comprehended. We looked at several heuristics which are used uh, by people to comprehend sentences for example, the late closure heurist, the minimal attachment heurist and the priming and anticipations as uh, heuristics for understanding or comprehending sentences. Next, we focused on to producing sentences of how the vertical and horizontal flow of information uh, uh, helps us in uh, producing different sentences. We looked at the serial uh, parallel and interactive model of uh, sentence productions and scope as scope and visual attention and uh, the role of these two factors into production of sentences. And lastly, we were interested in learning the uh, syntactic structures of sentences. So, we looked at how uh, children crack the code of understanding the syntax, how, how they learn the syntax of a, uh, of a sentence and how this uh, syntax uh, learning helps them in uh, generating meaning from sentences. And now, we come to this present language uh, course or uh, lecture where we are looking at what are, what are discourse and as I explained discourse is the highest form of language, it is basically talking among people, exchanging ideas among people. So, uh, if you look at figure skaters around the world and when they skate, they, they are in perfect synchronization. Similarly, when people talk, they are in perfect synchronization with each other, which means that when I speak something, the other person who is speaking back to me, we are both in sync. The moment we get out of sync, the conversation cannot take place. And so, for any conversation to take place, whether it is a conversation where many people take turns in speaking with uh, among uh, themselves or it could be a narrative in which one person is speaking and the other person is listening and waiting for his turn to maybe speak or waiting for the uh, conversation ball to drop. So, in, in both these cases, uh, you see that there is, there is a, a synchronization, a perfect synchronization. So, how does the synchronization uh, uh, takes place or how this synchronization is achieved? That is a wonder to be looked at because if you look at figure skaters, the synchronization that they actually uh, do in figure skating, they, it takes hundreds and thousands of hours of practice before this synchronization happens. But for us as human beings, talking among each other and making synchronizations is the easiest thing to do. So, an interesting thing will be looking at how this synchronization really works and for doing that, let us start by looking at the anatomy of a conversation. Let us break the conversation down and look at how the anatomy of a conversation is. So, conversation is what language is all about. As I said, most conversations are uh, the, the, uh, are the basics of any language. Now, talking interactions are, are uh, or uh, the spontaneous speech uh, 
people use as they engage in joint activities is the main function of any language. So, basically token interaction is the uh, main use of any language and what is this token interaction? It is the uh, uh, people talking among each other or uh, the speech that people share among each other when they are doing any joint activities. Converse, uh, but uh, you, you would know that conversations are more than sentence production because alternate people need to speak. So, just sentence production is not one part of conversation, the other part of conversation is also hearing the sentence. So, production and uh, uh, reproduction basically hearing somebody else and reproducing the correct answer is what conversations are all about. Now, in most conversations are in incomplete and in ill filled utterances as uh, uh, as, as a norm. So, conversations have ill defined sentences, ill formed sentences on uh, incomplete sentences. Now, this happens because we never plan when we are conversing we never plan ahead uh, uh, we, we, we never plan that we are uh, actually uh, go what we are going to talk and so we often experiences processing delays uh, in during which uh, we buy time for um, talking or what next sentence should come or what next idea should be floated. And so, uh, these uh, these time that we take in any conversation, the break that we uh, take in it, any conversation is filled up with something called conversation fillers. And so, what are conversation fillers? These are words like um, ah uh, and so on and so forth that are semantically empty, but are used to signal planning difficulties. So, uh, basically that is what it is. Now, although they these words are uh, they seem to disrupt syntactic structures, conversational fillers are actually beneficial to both uh, the speakers and the listeners. So, how are conversational uh, 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 fillers actually beneficial for both the speakers and the listeners? The idea is that uh, it gives the speakers for time uh, it gives the, provides the speaker enough time to think about what has to be said and uh, it also gives the, uh, the listeners some time to anticipate what is coming next and so it is actually beneficial for both the uh, parties in a conversation. Now, ill form utterances in conversation also result from planning errors as we have put, put uh, here. Now, uh, often speakers would simply drop a structure, uh, a sentence structure in mid sentence and start a new sen uh, sentence and other times speakers will perceive with an er er errant sentence attempting to steer it back to the intended message by taking on additional phrases and clause. And so, this kind of interaction that, that we have is the hallmark of any conversation. Now, uh, most of the meaning of a conversation does not reside on the semantics. When we are con uh, conversing, we are not actually looking for meaning in conversations. In general conversations, we generally do not dig too much for meaning and sometimes we have um, Ill, Ill meaning sentences or ill meaning <laughs> empty sentences also in conversations. So, uh, what is then the main aim of a conversation? The uh, most uh, beneficial or the, the most uh, desired part of a conversation resides in the pragmatics of the situation in which the conversation actually is taking place. So, semantics is not actually very important in a conversation. What is important in a conversation is the pragmatics of it. And so, what is pragmatics? The pragmatics are the various ways context contribute to meaning the basic discourse, right. And so, uh, Many of the content words in a conversation serves as indices to end, uh, entities and events that the participant all know about. Now, when we are uh, 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 conversing, uh, basically what uh, we are doing is we are conversing and so this conversation stands on something called the common ground and what is common ground? Common ground is the pool of information shared by participants on the conversation. Uh, so, uh, most conversations actually use something called the common ground. Now, because of common ground, uh, why is this common ground necessary? Be be it is necessary because of this common ground, the interlocutors which are the speakers in a conversation uh, or the participants in a conversation can be brief and vague in their references. Now, interlocutors or participant in a conversation can be both brief and vague because in a conversation why, why they can do that is because they have some kind of a common ground. They have some kind of a knowledge, background knowledge of what is being talked about and so empty oh yeah or that kind of filler conversations can also be used. Not all conversations has should have the semantics. Now, when we are uh, conversing uh, any hallmark 
So, uh, I have an example of a conversation here and you can see uh, 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 two people Aaron and Megan are talking and so says for instance, I mean I would not expect that uh, it was very common o overall that two people were talking at the same time that it would that it was really was lower and as you see people are, are gone. Now, if you look into it, this is the common ground only Aaron and Megan know what it refers to throughout the whole conversation. If I present this conversation to people, this written text of a conversation to people, it is very difficult to understand what is happening. Now, this meaning of it is only shared by these two people. Also, the use of I mean here is actually a conversation filler. So, this will give you an idea of what conversation fillers are and pragmatics is basically because we do not know the context, we do not understand what Aaron and, uh, Aaron and Megan are actually talking about and so that is why pragmatics is actually important. So, what the words are saying? Uh, is not important, the semantics is not important, the pragmatics is important. Also, we have something called combination fillers here, for example, yeah, no, uh, these and uh, that was all these are actually fillers that are used, and so uh, uh, when I said no, I do a repair of that using that was. Also, possibly a conversation filler, as you say here is a conversation filler, and here is the repair because I am trying to repair a sentence that is it. Uh, really was lower. Uh, so, a part of a conversation has happened and so I am trying to repair it and that is what it is. And so, as you can see the anatomy of a conversation, this is what the conversation is all about. When we converse people or interlocutors, they talk to each other and this is how they actually converse. Now, in a, the hallmark of any conversation is the seamless transition from one uh, uh, person interlocutor to another as people take turn in conversing. Now, how is this turn uh, decided or how is this turn constructed? Now, listeners predict when the current speaker will end uh, in uh, his or her turn and begin planning the response before the speaker turn ends. Now, in any conversation, most listeners actually uh, they have to do this predictive job of when the person who is conversing or who is speaking will stop and what kind of responses should be made. And so, this is called the turn construction. Now, conversations are composed of something called the turn conversational unit or turn conversational uh, uh, segment. Now, a turn conversational unit is generally a syntactic structure ranging from single word to a, a sentence and what it can do? It can make up uh, a turn in a conversation. So, it will tell you where the conversation br uh, breaks or how uh, how the response. So, somebody when somebody sto uh, stops in a conversation, what kind of responses has to be done. So, turn conversational unit is that particular thing. It is a syntactic structure which could be one word or sentence which actually tells you that a turn in a conversation has actually approached. Now, turns consist of more than one uh, turn can consist of more than one turn constructional unit, but turn uh, uh, transitions generally occur uh, between and not during them. So, it can have one uh, or main more than one turn con uh, construction unit, but this turn happens in between. Now, the end of each turn conversational unit consists of something called the uh, transitional relevance place. Now, in a turn, in a conversation, if this is my turn, this uh, the end of this turn conversational phrase, this phrase marks the end of my conversation. Let us say now this uh, it can after this it consists of something called the transition deliverance place. Now, what are transitional relevance place? So, it, the end of each turn, tra, turn constructional unit, it consists of a transitional relevance place. So, at this point, I have something called the transitional relevance place. This point is called actually the transitional relevance place. And so, what is it? It is a, tra, a transitional relevance place is basically a point in the conversation where the listener can expect the current speaker to end a turn. So, it is that point in a conversation which is marked by something called a turn uh, constructional unit and this place marks the end of a sentence and the next speaker should start. So, point in conversations where the listener can expect current speakers to actually end their turn. New speakers might start turn, but current speakers might also continue. So, syntax, semantics and prosody all signal approaching trans transitional uh, relevance places as the current sentences comes to a meaningful conclusion and the speaker's in intonation falls. So, basically the falling of an intonation of a speaker marks this uh, turn relevance place, but that that could that is not the only thing. Both the syntax, uh, the semantics, and the prosody 
all of them give some kind of a signal of when this turn in uh, uh, this ending in transition is actually happening. Another interesting fact of a conversation is something called turn transition and so what is turn transition? Now, turn transition from one speaker to another how one speaker when one speaker stops and the other speaker takes over this transition turn transition from one speaker to the next generally falls follows the principle of no gaps or no overlaps and what does it mean it refers to the tendency to avoid leaving a noticeable silence between turns of conversation so uh, uh, noticeable silence between turns of conversation and the beginning of a new turn before a current turn is fixed so basically basically what is uh, this no gap rule it says that the tendency to avoid leaving a noticeable silence is tendency to avoid leaving a noticeable silence between turn of a conversation and the beginning of a new turn before the current turn is finished. So, principles of no gap or no overlap says that general rule in turn transition and what it says is do not leave noticeable gaps between turns. Also, do not begin new turns before current turn is actually finished and so this is the rule that is actually being used. Now, longer gaps are perceived as silences and uh, they can be interpreted as hesitancy or awkwardness on the part of a speaker. So, if you have long gaps in conversation these are this can be interpreted as awkwardness sometimes awkwardness on the part of a uh, speaker oh, now uh, there are also situation when an overlap can happen so the overlaps can be interp interpreted as aggressive and an attempt to dominate the conversation so longer gaps between two speakers or two, uh, two more than two speakers are uh, are perceived as awkwardness on the part of a speaker but if longer uh, if many speakers start or two or more speakers start speaking at the same time or you start speaking over someone else this is in, interpreted as an aggressiveness or an attempt to dominate the conversation. Now, uh, the overlaps are not always considered a uh, route. Now, this kind of overlap two speakers uh, talking at the same time uh, this is not always negative it is not always rude, uh, rude to uh, start speaking at the same time as another person is speaking. Now, during a speaker's turn, it is common for the li listeners to make noises or nod the head to indicate understanding or agreement. Now, these back channels are signal uh, signals like mm or mm -hmm, uh, from the listener that indicate the engagement and encouragement of a speaker to continue. So, what are these back channels? These are signals from the people who are listening to the speaker to continue the speech or to go on with the speaker and so these are what are these back channels these are signals like mm -hmm or mm -hmm, mm -hmm or mm -hmm for the listeners and indicate the engagement and encouragement of a speaker to actually continue. Now, in face to face conversations speakers must even turn their gaze towards the listener uh, looking for visual cues of understanding if no work, uh, vocal uh, back channel is uh, is uh, being uh, or is forthcoming. Now, overlaps or instances when multiple interlocutors or people speak at the same time are interpreted negatively or positively depending on the context. So, these overlaps when pe many people start speaking at the same time they can be perceived positively or negatively depending on uh, the context in which it is actually happening. So, instances when multiple interlocutors speak at the same time, competition among interlocutors, negative interpretation. So, when uh, uh, people are competing with each other and they start speaking at the same time, this is taken as negative, but solidarity among interlocutors, it is taken as positive interpretations. Now, interlocutors may use a number of visual and vocal cues to signal their interest in taking or maintaining a turn and they monitor these in uh, partners as they constantly adjust their stance towards approaching or withdrawing from a possible turn. So, these are some of the factors uh, which actually explain how the turn transitions happen in conversations. Now, there are certain turn taking rules that has been proposed in many conversations and these rules were proposed by Sachs and others in 1974. Now, what did they do? They proposed a simple model of turn allocation. Now, this model has since received considerable empirical support and is now generally accepted as a standard model of conversational turn taking. And so, what is this model? The model consists of three simple rules that are applied in strict sequential 
order and so what are these rules the first rule is called the current speaker selects the next speaker now in this case what happens is as the tra uh, the transition relevant uh, place current speaker explicitly passes turn to the next speaker for example by asking a direct question now at a transition relevance place the current speaker explicitly passes uh, the turn to the listener and uh, this can happen in terms of asking a question the next uh, uh, step or the next rule that we use is called listener selects the self now if the current speaker doesn't select next speaker any listener may take up the turn multiple listeners attempt a turn but only one uh, but all but one will actually uh, uh, stay and others would drop out now if the current speaker doesn't select any a uh, speaker any listener may take up the turn now this does raise the possibility of overlapping turns but usually all but one will remain and all other people speaking will drop out the third rule is called the current speaker selects self and in this what happens is if no listener starts uh, the turn the current speaker may take up a new turn now if the speaker chooses not to take a turn the process uh, of cycle uh, from step 2 to 3 until someone takes a turn is actually repeated and so these are the basic turn uh, taking rules so either the current speaker selects a new speaker that could happen or a listener selects himself saying that i will take the turn and if nothing happens then the current speaker selects the self as uh, the speaker and if that it doesn't happen then 2 and 3 step is actually continued and so this gives you an actual idea of what is happening so you have step one where speaker selects the next one beat one beat is exactly uh, uh, kind of one fourth of a second the time it takes for you to take the decision now step two listener selects self or speaker selects self and if nothing happens then you keep on revolving between one and two as you can see at the end of the turn the current speaker may select the next speaker if the current speaker is silent for one beat any listener may, uh, may self select the next speaker and if no listener self uh, selects after one uh, more the current speaker may self select continue speaking the interlocutor uh, uh, cycle between step two and three until one of them actually takes the uh, converse, uh, takes the conversation now uh, how does we synchronize this turn now it is important to understand that these steps in this process are played in real time with each cycle extending the length of silence in uh, so uh, which basically means that each step takes up a certain interval of time uh, which is known as a beat so what is beat the beat is the average time it takes to produce a particular syllable now as said by the speaking rate of the last turn and timing of the step is in taking turn now this beat is generally thought to be the average time it takes to produce a syllable as uh, set by speaking rate of the last turn so how does the synchronization happens now uh, participants in a conversation they synchronize their behaviors at a number of levels first they can uh, they tend to sway their bodies in unison uh, and listeners match their beating rate to that of the speaker especially in uh, at transitional relevant places alternatively speakers can also tend to match the other in terms of the pitch in terms of the rhythm and in terms of the loudness the synchronization of rhythmic behavior uh, in social interactions are known as something called entrainment so what are entrainment entrainment are synchronizations of rhythmic behavior in social interactions and interlocutors sway bodies in unison match breathing rate pitch rhythm and loudness what is why it is done so that the speaker and the listener they maintain some kind of synchronicity or they, they make some kind of a unison among themselves so that everybody is in the same page kind of a thing they synchronize now how is this uh, how does the synchronization happens it is believed that entrainment results from the activation of something called the endogenous oscillators in the brain of the interlocutor now endogenous oscillators are neural circuits uh, that fire at regular interval and thus serve as internal timekeepers of the brain so what are these endo endogenous oscillators they actually help in maintaining this entrainment so these are neural circuits that fire at regular intervals and they save or serve as internal timekeepers for the brain now entrainment occurs when the firing rate of endogenous oscillators in the listener's brain match to that of the speakers as communicated through various visual signs and vocal signs so that is when the actual entrainment actually happens
So, this is a little bit about how uh, conversations actually uh, work or what is the rules of taking conversations. Now, let us uh, take a look at what are narratives and how narratives and references actually work. Now, a conversation is a form of a discourse uh, in which all participants contribute to its ongoing construction. So, everybody is taking part in a conversation and everybody is constructing the conversation. Now, in contrast to that, we have something called the narrative, which is a form of discourse in which one participant actually dominate as the active speaker while the other participant they assume the passive role as a listener and so that is what narratives are um, uh, mostly about. Now, the most extreme example of a narrative would be a speech or a lecture where the audience is uh, sitting quietly while the speaker is talking. So, let us now look at the various uh, forms and the various um, variables which affect narratives and then let us look at the nature of narratives to start with. Now, we can think of narratives within conversations as multi unit turn. Now, this would be uh, narrator typically in indicates the beginning of a narrative with a formulaic expression such as you will never believe what happened to me this morning or uh, did you hear the one uh, about. Now, in response the other interlocutors uh, show their willingness to yield the floor perhaps with an expression like what actually happened. And so, this is how the narratives uh, uh, tend to um, actually float. Now, the form of discourse in which uh, what is narrative? It is a form of discourse in which one participant dominates in the as active speakers and other participants assume the passive roles. As we said most uh, uh, discourse are of two types. We have something called the conversation where everybody is participating and the narrative when one person is speaking and the others are listening. So, what are narrative? Narratives within conversations in inside the conversation the narratives are multi turn units typically beginning with formal expression for example, you will never believe what has happened or did you hear the one about something something and this is what it is. And in response the interlocutor show their willingness to basically uh, the yielding the flow to the person who is creating the narratives. Now, as the narrative progresses, the listeners take a more active role. Uh, they provide vocal and facial expressions uh, such as gaps and winces, adding an emotional layer to the story's content. Now, listeners will also interject briefly comment like yikes, yikes, and oh no, at an appropriate places in the narrative and they make even supply words or phrases when it when it appears for the when it appears that the speaker is actually struggling to con uh, to uh, further the narrative in this way the listeners are active collaborators in building the narratives so listeners signal and uh, engagement by giving floor yielding expressions like what has happened or go on gazing at the speaker and providing appropriate back channel folk, uh, vocal and facial uh, 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 expressions in most narratives now conversation partners will often exchange narratives taking turns as storytellers most conversation partners they uh, involve this kind of narratives and they keep on taking this turn. Now, shop talk is actually a good example of this particular phenomena. What is a shop talk? When people exchange in uh, uh, engage in shop talk, they exchange new ideas uh, and how to uh, how to instructions pertinent to the shared profession or mutual interest. So, they ex in, in a shop talk people exchange new items and how to instructions pertinent to shared interest. They demonstrate access to privileged knowledge, but rapid and good identity. In short, uh, shop talk is more than just an exchange of uh, expertise information. It is also a way for participants to demonstrate that they have access to privilege knowledge. Also, shop talk helps the participants build rapport and create a good identity. Another form of uh, narrative in storytelling is called the spouse talk. And so, what is it? Uh, some narratives do not involve the exchange of any new ideas. Now, what uh, these an example is the spouse talk and what is this spouse talk? In this what happens is uh, the couples recount the past experiences together as ways to reminiscent and to bond. So, the couples recount past experiences and this is basically a way to reminiscent and actually uh, bond. Storytelling uh, 
uh, is another form of uh, the, this this kind of a narrative and so in storytelling is a cognitively demanding task storytelling when one person says the story and the other person is actually hearing the story now most storytelling is actually a very demanding task unlike lot of talk in interactions storytelling requires something called decontextualization now in uh, in in talk in interactions you can actually leave sentences halfway and have sentences meaning nothing but in storytelling uh, it is it's a little bit difficult because you tend to have something called uh, tend to require something called decontextualization and so what is decontextualization uh, the distancing of thoughts languages and behavior from the current situation so you have to distance yourself from current situation your thoughts from the current situation and behavior from the current situation and then only you can do this storytelling now to tell a story you need to detach your or, uh, you need to be able to relate events in the correct order and suppress unrelated thoughts while detaching yourself from the present moment. So, you not only have to think about ideas which are not uh, pertinent to the uh, present situation, you also need to present ideas in a correct sequence, in a correct order and also uh, you have to detach yourself from the present moment and then come up with a story. Now, telling a story taps into the executive functions of people, uh, for example, memory allocation planning, uh, inhibition and other cognitive uh, processes necessary for guiding uh, the intentional behavior. Now, storytelling is a vehicle for creating sense of solidarity among group membership. We have families, club cultures and organizations and national identity and so uh, storytelling is basically a vehicle for creating a sense of solidarity. Cognitive demands of storytelling as we saw it is called decontextualization, distancing our thoughts, language and behavior from the current situation. Talking interactions gain support from context, but storytelling does not. Now, telling the understanding, uh, telling and understanding story requires detaching from the present moment, suppressing unrelated thoughts, uh, memory resources for remembering actors and even in correct order, and executive functions, memory allocation, planning, inhibition, and other cognitive processes for inton, uh, for intentional behavior. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for this. The most forward area of the brain responsible for executive functioning, and so the prefrontal cortex is a major area in storytelling. Now. Storytelling requires a grammar of its own and that is called a story grammar. So, storytelling may be a highly demanding cognitive task, but we can perform it with such seeming the ease. Uh, why? Because narratives are so tightly structured. Now, when we tell a story, we relate a sequence of events in a temporal or a logical order. Events have to be fitted into a conversational framework if that includes a setup and provide background information followed by a sequence of events that lead to the dramatic or amusing resolution of a problem. Now, the framework guiding the presentation of events uh, and characters in a narrative is known as a story grammar. So, what is story grammar? This is a framework which guides the presentation of events and characters in actually a uh, story. Now, the fundamental building block of each story is called a episode and so what is episode the it is a fundamental building block of a story an episode generally begins with something called a setting which introduces the characters and location it begin it has something called an initiation e event which poses problem for the protagonist it has an internal response by proto uh, by protagonist to the problem it uh, attempt by protagonist to resolve the problem then a consequence of attempting may lead to success and failure and a reaction of protagonist to uh, to uh, 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 the consequences. So, then the uh, story begins with an episode uh, uh, and the story gram grammar explains how an episode is actually structured. As the episode begins with a setting uh, which is an introduction of the main character uh, and the location where the episode is taking place. Now, this is followed by an initiating event which is the problem or challenge the protagonist must actually face. The protagonist then attempt to uh, solve the problem and at this point the internal uh, thought processes of the protagonist are often revealed well. Now, as a consequence of this attempt the protagonist may actually either succeed or fail and whatever the outcome the protagonist will have reaction or consequences. Now, story grammars are related to the more general concept of the schema. We have seen the schema if you if you look at my previous lectures in cognitive psychology or human behavior you talked about what schemas are. So, schemas are uh, kind of a, a framework in which any event can be defined. Now, a schema is a mental framework for organizing or understanding how some aspects of the world actually work. So, talk in interaction the spontaneous use of speech as people engage in joint activities is the main function of any language.
So, we have something called a situational model or uh, references. As a speaker it, uh, relates a story, the listener must make a, a sense of it by building a situational model. So, once the listener is actually telling a story to someone, the other person must be able to relate to that story and how does he do that? Making the use of something called a situational model. What is a situational model? A situational model is a mental representation of all the entities and events in a story and how they are related. So, uh, generally in storytelling you have to have something called a schema which is the mental framework for organizing and understanding how some aspects of the world work and what is situational model? It is a mental representation of the entities and events in a story and how they are related. Imagery in your head as you listen to the story. Situational model is an imagery that one creates in the head. Also, uh, situational models are more than just imagery as they draw upon the schemas uh, already uh, uh, stored in the long term memory. So, they are drawn the schemas for generating expectations about long term memory. Now, uh, suppose your friend begins a joke with the line a priest, a minister and a rabbi walk into the war, uh, into the bar. You immediately call up the schema about the priest, the minister and rabbi which includes information about how these people look and actually behave. You also activate something called the bar joke schema which suggests that the bar may, uh, tender may have played a role in the punch line. All this information goes into the situational model you construct and you listen to the story. Oh yes, as for the punch line, the bartender looks at them and says, what is this? A joke. So, basically a priest, a minister and rabbi walks into the bar, we call on the schema of the priest, ministers and the rabbi and also call on the schemas about bar jokes and that will actually tell you how do you listen to this. So, Brian, this is about uh, references. Now, the speaker also has, uh, also has a situational model and use it to construct the narrative. Thus, the purpose of a narrative is to transfer the situational model from one mind of the speaker to uh, the mind of the listener. Now, to do this, to transfer the model of uh, the story from the speaker to the listener, the speaker needs to choose the words very carefully. Words and phrases uh, stand for or refer to the entities and events in the world which is either real or imagined. But any particular event or, or, or entity can be referred to by many different words. Now, a word or phrase that is used to represent a particular entity or event is actually known as a referring expression. So, Brian or that guy or introduce you to that particular part, uh, this is basically a reference. What is referencing? It is basically how we share expression. Now, a word or phrase that is used to represent a particular event or uh, uh, entity is known as a referring expression. The entity that is represented by a particular word or phrase is called the referent and the process of using uh, a word or phrase to represent an entity is actually known as referencing. So, the referent entity represented by word or phrase references process of using the word or phrase and represent a particular entity and referring expression word or phrases that uh, represents a particular entity. When speakers select referring expressions, they consider what is called the common ground that is knowledge they share when the listener, uh, with the listener and the privilege ground that is the information that one interlocutor knows but the other does not know. So, we use something called relevance in, uh, in, in a story. So, referencing is not the only thing, we also use something called relevance in, in uh, storytelling. And so, in storytelling, uh, when people are sharing ideas among each other, we, you, we use something called the referring expressions and they consist of what is known as the common ground, the, uh, common ground uh, and the privilege ground. So, what is common ground? The information that is shared by all interlocutors. In telling story, there has to be part of the story that everybody shares and there has to be part of the story that only the, list, uh, the uh, speaker shares because that, then only the story would move in a forward or in a, uh, in, in a direction. So, information which is shared by everyone is called the common ground information shared by all interlocutors. However, both speakers and listeners often overestimate the common ground. Now, we have something also called the privilege ground. This is the information of one interlocutor knows but the others do not know and so we have something called the uh, relevance theory also. So, how speakers distinguish what is common ground versus privilege ground is a matter of some debate. 
some researchers argue the speakers make inferences about listeners mental states but other researchers they maintain that speakers rely mainly on the memories of something called shared experiences with their listener to gauge the common ground now there is another fact uh, which is which is used in uh, this storytelling and that is called the relevance theory and what is the relevance theory it is proposed that speakers strive for a balance between uh, providing too much and too little information in choosing a reference expression providing more than enough information uh, especially when an entity is first introduced into a narrative may help the listener identify the referent faster although overly specific referring expression later in the narrative can actually hinder comprehension the speakers they tend to aim for a happy medium that minimizes the production of effort on their part while maximizes the comprehension effect uh, effort on the part of the listener when the happy medium li uh, li uh, where the happy medium lies depends on the particular situation so what is ref uh, the uh, relevance theory it is crafting referring expressions that is striving for balance between too much and too little information we generally fo uh, focus on something called the optimal level which is which is called the uh, minimal level so optimal reference level is neither too precise nor too vague to test the hypothesis that speakers aim for optimal re re relevance neither too precise nor too vague in crafting re uh, expression gibbs barron 2008 they approach people and ask for time they noticed that when persons were wearing a digital or a analog watch and in some cases they explained that their watch they noted that persons were wearing digital or analog watch and in some cases they also explained that their watch had stopped thus implying that the exact time was actually needed now among analog watch wearers were more likely to give rounded answers such as about quarter till 2 whereas digital watch wearers and uh, and both groups were more likely to give exact answers when the experimenter said that his watch were actually stopped and so this is what the optimal relevance time expression experiment was in random presentation we approached and asked for time either as a general question or with the explanation that the interview watch has stopped analog watch wearers were more likely to give approximate time in both the conditions however most digital wearers gave approximate in response to general questions even though they had access to the exact time and so this uh, talks about something called the relevance theory of how much information should be stared between people and so uh, we then need to negotiate referring expressions revolving referring uh, resolving referring expressions we strive for optimal relevance in response now in resolving referring expression that is in deciding what it means listeners also have a tendency to be egocentric so resolving referring expression how do we resolve this referring expression listeners use something called common ground situational cues and speakers eye gaze over time interlocutors negotiate economic reference expression we do this by using something called building ground implicit learning from subtle social cues more important than explicit memory patients with amygdala damage have been shown to have difficulty in building common ground and patient with hippocampal damage have no such difficulty so listeners do make use of common ground in identifying reference and they also make use of situational cues such as uh, uh, in uh, speakers eye gaze uh, there was a work by Hana and Tenhaus in 2004. They examined how listeners resolve references by actually engaging research participants in joint activity in which they made a cake together with the experimenter. Now, at the critical point in the task, the experimenter asked, hand me the cake mix. Uh, there were two cake mix boxes on the table one nearer the experimenter and the other in the participants now when the experimenters hand were full the participants more often picked the box nearer the experimenter but otherwise they uh, often picked up the box nearer to themselves and over time speakers and listeners they work together to horn referring expression thus when grandma says to grandpa get me thimang bing from the watch me la teach grandpa exactly knows what the grand, uh, 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 grandma means implicit learning from subtle social cues play an important role in the building of common ground and that are sort of explicit memory uh, that impacts the way the speakers craft expressions as well as the ways in resolving uh, them so what we did in uh, today's uh, uh, lecture is we looked at what is 
discourse. Now, as I said, discourse is the highest form of conversation and uh, the highest form of uh, language. And this discourse has two part. One is called the conversation, and we uh, the other is called the narrative. So, conversation is where a number of interlocutors are talking and exchanging ideas, and narratives is the form of in which one person is speaking, the other is uh, listening, and they uh, wait for their turn to come. Further to that, we also looked at what is the anatomy of a conversation. We looked at how turn taking, turn references, and all those things actually come in, how uh, people shift between turns. And in the second part, we looked at narratives. What are narratives and how narratives and storytelling is a part of a narrative and what are the factors which affect storytelling and how referencing is done in storytelling. And we looked at several examples of narratives and uh, several uh, explanations of narratives. This provides us some base on to what discourses are and these two kind of uh, uh, two divisions of discourse are. When we meet next, we will uh, continue from here and further on our discussion on discourse. So, up till we do that in the next lecture, it is goodbye and thank you from here.